Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, webinar titled Foreign Trade Zone FTZ Question and Answer Session. Today's webinar is sponsored by SCAR-U. Scarborough University was founded in 2006 with a mission to provide necessary, relevant, and continuing education to Scarborough employees, clients, and professionals engaged in international and domestic trade and logistics. My name is Kevin Ekstrand. I am a licensed customs broker and certified customs specialist. I have the privilege of being vice president of sales and marketing for Scarborough International, and it's an honor to be with you today. This is an interactive webinar, and we are here to answer your questions, uh, many of which were submitted um, when you registered for this uh, webinar. Um, but anyways, please submit questions. That's why we're here. You will find a Q&A button at the top of your screen. Your questions will appear for the audience to see, so you may choose to show your name or be anonymous. I ask that you start submitting your questions right now. Please also note that you can adjust your windows. Um, please click on the top of the video portion to maximize or minimize this piece of the webinar so that you can be sure to see the um, actual uh, presentation that, uh, that uh, we're going to go through briefly before we uh, begin to answer your questions. So while you're adjusting your screens and posting your questions, I'll take a minute to introduce you to Scarborough. Scarborough is a full service logistics company that has been operating for over 31 years. We are headquartered in the heart of America, Kansas City, where faith, family, and hard work make for a great organization. We also have offices in Chicago, St. Louis, Des Moines, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and Shanghai, China. We also have recently added a sales presence in New York and Dallas. Um, beyond our own offices, we are part of a network of companies that puts us in every country around the world. In other words, we're going to take good care of you. We are truly a great partner to our clients. We collaborate, stand by their side, and actively participate in their growth opportunities by helping them navigate import and export regulation around the world. We value each and every partnership along with each and every relationship we build along the way. As always, I would like to thank each of you for being here today. To our many clients on the call today, thank you for your partnerships. If you are not yet a Scarborough client, we welcome an opportunity to earn your trust and partnership. Now, let me introduce you to um, our presenter today, Mr. Adam Hill. Adam is a licensed customs broker, a certified customs specialist, certified export specialist, and an MBA. Adam sits on the Trade Support Network with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Um, we are pleased to have Adam as our Vice President of Operations for both Scarborough International and Scarborough de Mexico. Um, and I'm also glad to call Adam a friend. So Adam, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Um, like Kevin said, we're going to take a few minutes and just go through a quick um, little synopsis on what is an FTZ, tell you a little bit um, about them, um, and then open the rest up for questions at the end. Um, so most people don't even know what an FTZ is, but you know, a foreign trade zone is inside of the United States. It's a designated location. Um, you can kind of think of it as um, a so it's kind of like an area inside of the United States that is designated as what I will call almost foreign soil. So things that are inside the foreign trade zone haven't entered the commerce of the United States yet, according to the customs laws. So that allows you to do things inside of a foreign trade zone that without actually clearing customs that you normally couldn't do. So for example, if you import something, you know, that and you want to do some quality control on it, you would have to clear that product before you could ever do QC on it. Um, inside of a foreign trade zone, you can actually do that QC work, look at the product, make sure it's right, before you then go ahead and clear through customs. So that's just one small thing um, that you can do. Um, so with that, you do have to activate a foreign trade zone. Um, the process is not overly uh, complicated, um, but it is detailed. Um, we have um, actually the president of the Kansas City Foreign Trade Zone on the call today, Mr. Al Figley. Um, he, he won't be doing any presentation, but he uh, is available for phone calls or emails um, after this, and we can get you his contact information if anybody would like it specifically here for the Kansas City market. 
So in order to activate, what do you need to do? Um, it is a written application. Um, you need to make sure we have a description of the zone sites, any kinds of operations you're going to do inside of that zone, whether it be manufacturing, um, those in the textile world, maybe it's decorating and, you know, it could be quality control. It could be simply, it could be storage for deferment of duties. It could be something that you, Im that you import that is ultimately destined for another country. So you could bring it in. Um, you need a statement of the general character of the merchandise to be admitted. A blueprint of the area, and that is approved by the foreign trade zone board to be activated. Um, it does need to show all the measurements um, and then any openings to the building. Um, one thing I always like to note here is, is as you're going through this process, um, we always advise folks to make sure that they include their parking lots as part of their foreign trade zone. Um, the reason for that is, is when you have overflow, we have a lot of clients that will then take cargo, put it, you know, rent a trailer, take that cargo, and then move it out into their parking lot just in the stored trailer um, during their overflow time. The problem is, is if your building is a foreign trade zone and then that cargo leaves those four walls in, in your um, parking lot, it's not also part of your zone, you've just removed that product from the foreign trade zone. Um, so it's, it, it's a pretty small detail, but it's something that's obviously very important. Um, you also need to put together a procedures manual detailing your inventory control processes, your record keeping, um, and then and then any activities that are going on inside of that zone. And then finally, you, need, you do need the written concurrence of the grantee um, when you actually apply for activation, who is the person who actually kind of runs that zone um, more from the administrative side. So prior to what's called the alternative site framework, um, a general pur purpose zone typically took four to six months. Um, and that's for something that's pretty basic, um, talking about maybe just product in and out, maybe some export, some deferment, but not a lot of manufacturing, um, something very simple. The more detailed, you know, anywhere from eight to 14 months. With the new alternative site framework, that, that, times, you know, that time frame has drastically reduced down to 45 to 60 days. Um, it also reduces attorney's fees for those of you who go the route and use an attorney. Um, one thing I will say about that 45 to 60 days though, is don't assume that you can start on day one and be done by day 60. There's definitely a good amount of work that leads into that 45 to 60 day process um, where you're actually going through the activation process itself, creating the manuals, getting all your diagrams. Um, there are certain insurances that have to be carried, things of that nature. So there is a little bit of confusion in the marketplace in general about, there's something called a bonded warehouse and then there's something called a foreign trade zone. And so the next couple of slides, we're gonna talk a little bit about what is the difference um, and all the way from entry down to what you can do inside the zone. So, so we start at the top, just a basic customs entry. So in order to get a product into a bonded warehouse, you actually have to file a customs entry, which means that unless you're a self filer, you need to hire a customs broker. Inside of a foreign trade zone, there is no actual customs entry. Um, the form itself is called a 214, um, and, and there is a lot less data required on that. We have a lot of customers that do that themselves. Um, we handle that process for customers as well. Um, a lot of it depends on your own internal processes and what you would prefer to take on. Um, the, the next step down, what is allowed inside of those? So in a bonded warehouse, you can only put foreign goods. In a foreign trade zone, you can put both foreign and domestic goods. And you might not think that's a big deal, but if you kind of think through that, if you're going to manufacture something, you probably have both. You have product that came from Asia, from Mexico, from Europe, you know, plus you have product that came from down the street. You know, maybe someone in Cleveland, Ohio provides something to you, and then someone from Dallas, Texas provides something to you. So with that, you can manufacture inside of that zone, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, and take advantage of some potential duty savings there. So speaking of duties, when you put goods into a bonded warehouse, um, you don't have to pay duties. But when you take them back out, you have to pay the customs duties. For a foreign trade zone, 
the difference is, is that they only have to be paid when they're entered into the commerce of the United States for consumption. So if you're going to manufacture something and then ship it back out of the country, you never had to pay customs duties on that product. If you imported things that you're just storing for inventory and that inventory got sold to Canada, you never had to pay customs duty on that product. So that's a huge difference um, between the two of them. Um, this is something that is that is very interesting is that there's an inventory tax. Um, a, lot, a lot of you might not be aware of it, but your finance people certainly are. Um, inside of a bonded warehouse, um, all goods are taxed. Inside of a foreign trade zone, those goods are still considered foreign. So there's a reduction in your inventory tax because the amount of money that is, that is cost to basically uh, landed for that product now gets removed from that calculation. And so there's an inventory tax savings as well. The, and the, the next difference is the storage period. So inside of a bonded warehouse, you can only have goods in there for five years. And I know that doesn't seem like a big deal, like I don't have any inventory that sits longer than five years, but yes, you do. Um, lots of people do, lots of people have, have inventory that, that sits there for, for a long time. Um, inside of a foreign trade zone, it's unlimited. The other interesting thing about that in the unlimited thing is you can take advantage of that foreign trade zone, even to import machines. Maybe you, the machine that you need to make your product comes from Germany. You know, machines are tend to be dutiable in that 3% range. Um, if you import that product and you're paying 3% on a million dollars, that gets to be expensive fast. If you can put that into a foreign trade zone and use it inside of that zone, you never had to pay customs duties on that item. And that's something that people don't often think about when they're looking at what are some of the advantages of the zone itself. The other advantage here um, with that is product that maybe during your manufacturing processes that um, becomes waste, product that doesn't meet quality, those items never have to be entered into the commerce, so therefore you don't have to pay customs duties on them, which is a big additional savings as well if something gets scrapped. Um, the control of the goods. This is something that most people also don't realize is that customs is the one in control of the goods inside of a bonded warehouse. Um, any requests must be made to CBP to do anything before you can do anything to those goods. So if you wanna open a box of your own cargo in your own bonded warehouse, you have to file a manipulation with US Customs in order before you can go open that box inside of a foreign trade zone, as long as that was part of the original application of things that you are wanting to do and it's already been approved, then you can pretty much do what you want inside of the zone. Um, there's obviously some rules and, and regs that govern that, but for the most part, um, any normal business activity can be done inside of the zone without having to go to customs and ask them to let you do something. Um, we talked a little bit about domestic goods already. Um, permitted activity, you know, we've talked about it, you know, in the bond and warehouse, you can do three things. You can clean, repack, and sort. But the rest of that is under CBP supervision. Inside of an FTZ, cleaned, packed, sorted, destroyed, graded, labeled, assembled, manufactured, exhibited, commingled with other freight, and none of that is under the customs purview until that product leaves that foreign trade zone into the commerce of the United States. Um, manufacturing, just in general, you can do that in a zone and you can't. The waste, we just talked about that as well. So really quick, um, we wanted to show you this and I know we have um, people logged on from all over the country, but here's just an example of Kansas City's foreign trade zone. Um, activity between the Kansas and Missouri state line. So everything that you see with the red flag there is a current foreign, is currently activated as part of a zone inside of Kansas City. So we have stuff going, you know, about an hour west of the city up to about an hour and a half north, northeast of the city. Um, Scarborough's in the process of becoming one of these small flags on here as well as um, our operations will also be a foreign trade zone. And I think there could be some benefit for a lot of not only our current clients, but, but other clients in, you know, in the area that have overflow. Um, you can kind of see why Kansas City is important to us um, because of how close we are to so many major cities. We're basically two to three days from any point in the country, um, which is a, 
from a domestic perspective is a very nice spot to be. So like I said, this is just an example. So, you know, and Kansas City is not the largest international trade market. So if we get into some of the larger cities, there are some more foreign trade zone opportunities that exist inside of them. Talk a little bit about foreign trade zones and, and there's really there's four types of merchandise that can go in. So um, this is all about how can you create duty savings for your company? So there are things, so a lot of product goes in is what's called non-privileged foreign. What that means is that when that product finally leaves the zone, that at the duty rate when that happens, that is when it is assessed. There's also what's called privileged foreign, which is duty is assessed as the cargo enters the zone and it retains that duty rate. So we can maybe use something like anti-dumping. You know, you might have product that you want to bring in because you know that there's an anti-dumping rate coming out, getting ready to be 200% on something, you can bring it in as privileged foreign when the duty rate is still only 5% and hold that rate through. So that is another big advantage. Um, zone restricted cargo. That cargo has to either be exported or destroyed. Um, we see this a lot in there are some pharmaceuticals that aren't allowed to come into the country. Um, there are certain arms and firearms that aren't allowed to be imported, um, but they can come into a zone, things can be done, and then they can leave the country or be destroyed. And then obviously you have domestic product, and that can also enter the zone like we talked about in order to marry up with some of that other foreign product that you're bringing in. And then when you take it out, you take it all out as a kit, a tractor, a car, anything like that. So I kind of want to walk you through what the process looks like. Um, we have the old paper process, um, which looks a little bit intimidating. And so just to give you an idea, this is how it would look for Kansas City. You can apply this to any other foreign trade zone. So cargo moves in bond from Los Angeles, New York, into the port of Kansas City. We then have to send the 214 to the zone, and the zone will say, yes, I'm willing to accept this. Then I send that same 214, it's a piece of paper, down to customs. And customs says, yes, you can move that cargo into the zone. Then when the trucker goes to pick that up, he also signs the 214, stating that he understands this is bonded cargo. Then once it gets into the zone, the 214 is signed by the zone operator saying, yes, we got everything. So before we're done, we have about six signatures on here, um, a lot of back and forth. So that is something that with the new electronic process, which is what's called E214, removes a lot of that headache. Um, it can all be done electronically now. There is no more paper moving back and forth. The other benefit is what's called direct delivery. So direct delivery means that in bonds, which were previously cut to the port of Kansas City, can now actually be, be cut directly into your foreign trade zone. There's some benefit there as well from a timing aspect from cargo can actually arrive into your zone and you can unload it prior to the 214 ever being finished. Now the window's tight, but there is some time there where previously you would have had to make sure cargo was cleared, you had to get pickup numbers and go through this whole process in order to get that container to move from the rail yard to your zone. With direct delivery, you can skip all of those steps. Um, which is also a big time saver. A lot of people say it saves them two to three days alone just in direct delivery from going the old paper route. Talk a little bit about the manufacturing opportunities and the duty savings um, that can be created in, inside of a foreign trade zone. So here's the scenario. We have a vacuum manufacturer that imports motors for final assembly in the, in the United States. Motors, as, as they come in, are dutiable at 4%. So that manufacturer, though, wants to manufacture their, their vacuums in the USA, but it's just too expensive. They can't get that motor at a good enough rate here in the U.S. in order to do that. But if they create a foreign trade zone, they can import that motor, not pay the duties on it. They can then assemble that vacuum and manufacture that vacuum from a motor here and then products you know, maybe there's some products from down the street, something else from China. And then when that product leaves the zone, it's no longer a motor, it's a full vacuum. And vacuums are dutiable at 0%. So what you did is you did all of that work in the United States. So you can claim your product was at a minimum assembled here, potentially made here. And you're, you're taking 
multiple, you know, multiple duty percentage equations out of, you know, your, your whole sales price because you went from paying 4% and you just added 4% to the bottom line just because you didn't pay customs duties on that vacuum alone. And this exists in a lot of industries. Most of the auto manufacturers are this way as well because cars are, entire cars are dutiable at lower rates than most of the parts that are imported for cars. That's why a lot of the auto manufacturers are all foreign trade zones. Also allows them to export cars without having to pay customs duties on them ever. So a couple of words of caution here, and we're getting here real close to where we're just gonna go into the question session is, one of them is, make sure you know your business. Um, there are FTZ consultants out there that will go down this following scenario. So you're an importer and you file a thousand entries annually and every one of those entries, they're going to make an assumption uh, that you paid $485 in merchandise processing fee, which is the maximum amount you can pay. Then they're going to tell you that inside of a foreign trade zone, you only have to file one customs entry a week. So that took that thousand entries all the way down to 52 entries. Well, that same $485 max for merchandise processing fee applies. So now you're only gonna spend $25,220. So your, your savings off, off the bat is $460,000. We have seen this multiple times. And the reason I say know your business is because most of you never hit the $485 max in the first place. So a great example is we had a client um, go through this process and they came to us after the fact and they said, we have pitched this, you know, and, and there's a big savings there. And we ran the numbers and we said, it doesn't make sense to us because they were only spending about $30,000 a year in MPF already. And they're getting ready to spend 25,000. So it took a $400,000 savings down to $5,000. And at that point, it's not worth it. So be wary of that pitch because that is how they're going to come in. That is how they're going to turn the heads of your upper management because anybody that sees almost half a million dollars in savings is going to pursue an opportunity. Um, a couple of things also to note inside of that is, is your receiving process robust enough to handle this? Your inventory has to be impeccable. Um, the reason for that is things that leave a foreign trade zone that didn't actually get cleared, um, that's a felony. So we've even seen people get into the foreign trade zone business to present theft from their own facilities. Because now it might, you know, maybe someone's been walking out with a hand tool or something like that, and the tool might only cost $20 and they don't think it's a big deal. If they walk out with that same $20 tool out of a foreign trade zone, they have just committed a felony. So that's a big de um, uh, determinant to actually moving product out of that foreign trade zone that shouldn't have ever been. Um, do you need new software? You know, there is a lot more um, layers that go into this now. FIFO becomes very important, assuming that's your inventory um, controls. And it, you know, customs, and you have to then report back on this every year, and you have to be able to prove that stuff that came in was received, and where it went, and then stuff left, and you know, did did that, did those items enter the commerce of the U.S.? Did those items leave the country? Were they destroyed? And so you have to be able to tie those back down to each one of your individual units that you import. Um, and then finally, we just talked about it is. How accurate is your inventory? Maybe you receive your product really well, but you know people tend to take things. The sales guys always screw this up because <laughs> they want to come in and they think that there's a sample and they're used to walking into a warehouse and you know they might open a box, grab four samples, and leave. They can't do that inside of a foreign trade zone. So those are some of the controls that have to be in place before we can even start down this path of. Are you interested in becoming one? Um, my assumption is if you're going to want to do this, it's going to take you six months to a year to go through this process, set yourself up, and make sure you have the processes in place in order to actually do this. So with that, um, questions have been coming in, and I'm going to let Kevin start to kind of filter through what we've seen um, and talk to you guys a little bit more and answer some questions. Well, Alan, let's just um, general discussion with you now. 
you you brought up the example of the motors and the vacuums. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a dutiable, dutiable item in a motors that you want to avoid um, avoid the duty on, mm -hmm. um, because vacuums can come out of the zone duty free. Um, and what type is that? And I guess one of the questions I would get is, well, my item that I import is duty free, you know, and the item that I manufacture is not. Would there ever be a case where you would want to take advantage of foreign trade zone in that environment too? Yes, actually. And, and the reason is, is because using the example of the vacuum um, is one way to declare those products as they leave the foreign trade zone. If we were to flip flop that, you could actually claim each individual part as it leaves the foreign trade zone and not the whole. And that way you could take advantage of those 0% duty rates, which you can't, which, so you would still be able to take advantage of, but for some of you who need product that says assembled in the U S or made in the U S you might be able to import enough and put enough value into that product to make that product U S origin now. So that's the difference between that zoned, Privileged and non-privileged, right? Right. That, that, that kind of uh, category in there. Another thing that, um, who does this really make sense for? For foreign trade zones. We get that a lot, um, you know, people that, that are importing quite a bit, you know, who does a, who, who's the big benefactor of doing a foreign trade zone and who on the call today, if they're out there, should really be, uh, should really be looking at this? So, I think anybody that spends um, a lot of money in customs duties, this is something that you could definitely look at um, for a couple of reasons. One is just a potential duty deferment. So you might import two months worth of inventory, but you only pay customs duties when that product leaves the zone. So if you have a slow month and maybe you don't move as much product, you're not paying customs duty on that inventory that's just sitting and holding. So there is a cash flow incentive there. Um, there's also the savings like we talked about with the inventory tax, um, get, getting duty out of that equation in order to keep the inventory tax dollars lower. Um, you know, so that's one spot. Anybody who manufactures, even if your items aren't very, you know, maybe you spend a lot of 1%, 2%, some free, but the item that you're exporting is duty free, the item that you're making. You know, have you ever gone through that process and say, well, I import this stuff and I put something all together and I create something to sell to somebody, what is that item? How is it dutiable? Um, textile companies, there's a lot of them inside a foreign trade zone. You know, duty rates on textiles run anywhere from 16 to 32%. And, you know, they do decorating a lot and they have scrap and they have waste. And that's a very expensive problem to have if you import something and you've just spent 32% duty on it and then you have to scrap it because the decoration on it's wrong. And so to me, that's where you really start to see the advantage. Um, we do have some people who just simply do it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we, we do have some people who just simply do it in order to um, just defer what little duty they pay a little bit farther out. Um, but I think for the most part, manufacturers are a great spot. Anybody who exports their items often is a great spot. Maybe you only have one distribution center. You import everything, let's say, into Kansas City and then you sell that product globally. Well, there's no reason for you to pay customs duties on that product, let it sit here in Kansas City for two months, and then sell it to Canada, because you're, you either have just paid the duty and you're stuck, or we can try to file for duty drawback, which means you can only get 99% of that back, but then there's other service fees that go into that as well. So on a global competitiveness, bringing an item in without duty paid, if you're selling to a global market, you can actually that affects the either the, the cost of the item mm -hmm. or it could be automatic margin right to the bottom of the item if they're if if you're selling an item if you're talking about competitiveness on a global market Absolutely. for for any any type of good really Absolutely. if you're doing a lot of export importations then following up with exporting that product out yeah. and i guess kind of something along those lines is you your own facility doesn't necessarily have to be the foreign trade zone so there are zones, and that's what Scarborough is actually in the middle of setting up, is a zone where we can have multiple customers enter product into our zone. Now, we can't set up a manufacturing site inside of our warehouse, but for those of you who just want to store product, you know, maybe something, maybe some of you sell to some of the big automotive folks, and they already have foreign trade zones. 
you know, then you can take advantage of what's called a zone to zone transfer. You can import product in, put it in a foreign trade zone, whether it's your own private one or it's a public one, and then transfer that product to them and never pay customs duties. And, you know, like you just said, then it's either additional margin on that product or it allows you to be that point or two more competitive that you weren't previously because you were paying that customs duty. Okay, so I think that probably answers uh, Matt's question here, who, who asked, um, if there, is there a minimum annualized container volume or using a foreign trade zone because it's cost, cost reductive and so forth? Um, I might mention on that, and I've done a lot of business with foreign trade zones over my uh, years in this business as well. Um, while there's not a minimum, there is an administrative cost to mm -hmm. managing your own foreign trade zone. Absolutely. It might be different when, when Scarborough is managing our foreign trade zone um, and so forth. That, that administrative cost might be a little less for the actual importer, but if, if an importer wants to do their own foreign trade zone, there's an administrative cost. There's annual reporting, there's the inventory, mm -hmm. um, um, the taxes and, and things like that that they need to, to make sure that they can manage internally, right? So there is an administrative cost, plus there's a cost to getting set up beyond just your time. Right, no, absolutely. Right in, that, in that four to, in that six month or right. year, year period that you think, it, you, you know, that it really takes to get one set up. So we just had, um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of what some of those costs might look like, you know, we have seen, you know, attorneys to get set up pretty basic zones um, run into the low six figure. So, you know, $100,000, $150,000. So that's not cheap. So that's the kind of savings that you need to start to look at. Can you generate in order to return some of that investment? You know, if you don't go through attorneys and you go through other third parties like us, or, you know, there, there are other companies that do that, the prices do come down from just using an attorney. Um, we're just not an expensive, as expensive as attorneys charge, uh, per hour. But, um, you know, I think that if you're not going to save or there's not a potential to save upwards of, you know, 50, $75,000, it might not be worth it to you because of that administrative burden. You know, we've talked to people who've had to hire somebody and that's their sole job is to administer the zone. And so just in that alone, you're, you're talking someone's salary and benefits, you know, you know, and then all the overhead that goes into it, their computers, if we have to buy software, how much does that cost? So there has to be a relatively good savings in order to get into it if you're going to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think we had a question is how, how does the small guy benefit? And in my mind, the small guy benefits by using three PLs, four PLs to help them through this process because we already have that stuff done. We have the software in place. So with that, you're not covering that. What you're covering is more like warehouse charges rather than um, administrative salary type fees that you're going to get if you're running your own zone. You know, so maybe for the small guy that that has cash flow issues as he's starting off early, but he can pay the hundred dollar storage bill every month for his one pallet. You know, it might not be might be a good spot, so he doesn't have to pay the three thousand dollars in customs duty. So there are some advantages there that a smaller guy could take advantage of, even if we're not looking at that six figure type savings um, to really dive into his own full force. You know, and, and for those smaller guys, as you grow, you know, there will become a tipping point where you say, well, maybe I want to do it myself and I want to house it in house. Um, but even then we have folks that utilize other parties to manage and run that foreign trade zone, even if it is their own private one. Obviously that adds another layer of cost to it, but that is also an opportunity um, in, inside of a foreign trade zone. So you as the importer don't specifically have to run that zone. Okay. Here's a question from uh, Jacob Perry. Jacob's a good friend of Scarborough's, uh, Scarborough International. Um, and, and he asks, is it feasible and advantageous to apply for a foreign trade zone for a shipment of less than 20000 that is simple import into the U.S. from a foreign country? I think we need a little bit more information, like, you know, what kind of duties are we talking about? Um, but yes, you could use it. I mean, you could defer custom duty. So if we take this example, let, well, let's say let, the duty rate is... Um, well, let's, let's I mean, in, in Jacob's case, and I know Jacob, mm -hmm. know Jacob well, you know, a food product that's admissible by the FDA. Okay. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a relatively young business. Mm -hmm. 
starting, you know, that's, that's, that, that's growing, would it make, I guess, a cost benefit to, to start that early on in the process for, for a food product that's dutiable in the, you know, 5% range and things like that? No, I could definitely see that. Um, you know, especially as, I, as you import that product, you know, it's doubtful you're going to sell that entire shipment right away. So, you know, maybe you, you don't want to spend those duty, you know, that duty money up front and you want to be able to store your product somewhere. You know, I don't think it's feasible to set up your own, but, you know, I think there are definitely scenarios where you could utilize a third or a fourth party in order to use someone else's public zone you know, maybe to defer some duties and, and, and save some honey. I don't think you're going to get windfall benefits from it, mm -hmm. but I do think it could help. Right. Because paying, paying for warehousing in a public zone is going to be more expensive yes. from an administrative level than doing Absolutely. it in your own zone. So, Absolutely. so Jacob, I guess my, my answer to you would be is, is we can look at the scenarios and, uh, and, and try to look at cost and see if it would be better, but, but kind of back to Matthew's question earlier, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis of, uh, of how to manage it. So I, I think that would be probably our, mm -hmm. our answer. You know, if you were, you know, and what I heard you say earlier is, is folks with high duties, mm -hmm. apparel companies, things like that, you know, that where they have, you know, shirts, bags, right. um, high duty bowl items, footwear, those kinds of things that sit on the shelves, for a long period of time waiting mm -hmm. to fulfill orders. So, so maybe they customize shirts or mm -hmm. things for our businesses or, or uh, you know, different seasons, say the sporting season. My son plays soccer. So, you know, starting in June after tryouts and right. so forth, everybody is purchasing their uniforms, which means they're out to order thousands of uniforms. And, and these companies have these sitting on the shelf waiting for these thousands of, of, of uh, orders to come in through the summer. Absolutely. So in those cases where they've paid lots of duties, or they would have paid lots of duties, putting them in a foreign trade zone, waiting for the orders to actually come, and then handling the um, the decorating and so forth, and then pulling them out of the zone is probably a better scenario because they, they've probably got the payment for them even. Absolutely, absolutely. So in a situation like that, it would it would be very very beneficial. Um, agricultural equipment too. I mean, those guys, mm -hmm. uh, especially here throughout the Midwest, where we have lots of offices. Um, you know, a lot of ag stuff is, is duty free, but the component parts are not right. they're imported. So that might be a benefit. Um, someone's looking for clarification here real quick. You mentioned Scarborough is becoming a full function FTZ or third party FTZ. I know you have other locations. Are you just doing this in Kansas City or other locations as well? So maybe you can uh, you can uh, pull back the curtain on what we're doing there here. Yeah, I know. So um, we have just started the process to um, get um, our Kansas City office, our Laredo office, and our Chicago office set up as foreign trade zones. That will allow cargo to move across the country through foreign trade zones, never enter into the commerce of the U.S. It will allow us, um, specifically in Laredo, there's a lot of cargo that moves in from Asia that is bonded cargo. In order for that cargo to move into Mexico, for those of you who ship stuff into Mexico, Everything that goes into Mexico is inspected by the Mexican broker. Well, since Scarborough is on both sides of the border and we're a Mexican broker, it will actually allow us to receive that inbound cargo, review that cargo without having to file a manipulation with customs, but leave that product under what's considered customs custody, do what we need to do from a Mexican customs entry perspective, and then allow that cargo to cross the border. Um, that'll help us um, let our clients reduce their fees you know, there's no manipulation. It'll help speed up the supply chain because we're not waiting for those manipulation approvals to come back. Or if customs wants to view them, view the manipulation, waiting for them to come. Um, and actually, you know, and that might be two or three days where we're stuck just waiting for CBP to show up. So, you know, that's really the big reason in Laredo, Kansas City, and then, like I said, Chicago. So all three of those um, locations are going to be becoming foreign trade zones here in the next six months or so. Okay, good. I think you also uh, mentioned uh, about how uh, 3PLs, 4PLs can benefit small suppliers, tier 2, 3 thinking, particularly auto industry, by acting as a conduit for purchase and delivery of foreign source components and assemblies. How can, how can we benefit? How can 3 and 4PLs in FTZs benefit small suppliers? Um, I think, you know, one going back to a lot of those folks already are foreign trade zones. 
So that'll allow you to import product into a foreign trade zone. Um, you know, since it's small, you're probably going to want um, to use, you know, a public zone um, just so you don't have to put the administrative cost into getting that original zone set up. But, you know, I think that's a benefit in saving that duty and then just transferring it straight into a zone. I think early on, you know, if there's quality problems, if you need to run testing, things like that, there could be a benefit of utilizing a zone um, in order to check that quality. If it's bad, sending it back. We're never paying customs duties on that. You know, a lot of stuff about a foreign trade zone, um, a lot of people think about it, is that deferment of duties or just not paying them in general? Because that tends to be, you know, a good portion of the cost of your goods, especially if we get into some of those higher dutiable items. You know, we talk about nuts and bolts and screws and textiles, and there's a lot of things that we import that you pay duties on and to either completely get rid of those, defer those, or maybe only pay on part of it because only part of it's coming into the US is really where the savings comes from. Okay, I got a question here it was submitted at the time of the, um, uh, the uh, registration. And it was from an importer of bulk products that imports an entire vessel mm -hmm. full of bulk products that are duty free. Do you think that they would benefit, could they benefit from a foreign trade zone? I guess it would be how many, if they were doing multiples a week, um, at high values? I don't really see, benefit? because you're still going to max out at that, you know, you're, you're maxing out a merchandise processing fee already. So you're paying that 485. So if you're on, let's say you're doing a vessel a month, no is the answer. Let's say you're doing five vessels a week. Yeah, there might be a small amount of savings in just that MPF um, and putting that product into, this, into a zone um, my gut says there's not a lot of opportunity there, yeah. but so in a duty free situation, the only benefit, the only thing to look at is how many shipments per week in order to see if MPF savings would, would be a benefit for well, you, you, correct? No, that's true. But then don't forget that we have the, you know, is any of it scrap? Did any of it get wasted? Did we screw something up and need to fix something? You know, so there are some other opportunities. Um, even if your product's duty free, um, to utilize the zone, um, to even you know maybe it might reduce that NPF a couple of dollars, or you know you're you're taking a zero percent product and adding it to something else, but you really want that made in the USA or assembled in the USA. So there's some benefit in or some potential benefit for that as well. All right, and Mary had asked about zone to zone um, was something that they were most interested in. Um, so again, maybe just that zone to zone process. Yeah, zone so, transfers. so let's maybe use the example ability. here is that there is a, that Scarborough, Kansas City is a foreign trade zone and Scarborough and Laredo is a foreign trade zone. I can actually move product from Scarborough and Kansas City to Scarborough and Laredo um, bonded, take it out of one zone and put it in another one and that product still has not entered the commerce of the United States, therefore we're still not paying duties. Um, that also works across companies as well. So if it's Scarborough here and it's a foreign trade zone in um, New York and we need to transfer product, we can do that. And that product still stays duty free. You know, the big catch there is making sure that um, we cut an in bond as it leaves the zone. We make sure we check in, you know, check it out of our inventory, the appropriate quantities. We make sure the trucker we're using is bonded. And then when that product arrives into the new zone, it has to be pulled as the zone transfer into that new zone and make sure their inventory records are updated as well. But we're still never entering the commerce of the US, so we're still not paying duties on it. Okay. Um, here's a question real quick um, from an anonymous viewer. Can a shipment that is in transit use an FTZ? Now that leaves a lot for us to kind of assume, but you know, I'll throw some scenarios okay. at you, okay? Um, I was importing, a, I was going to import a product, I found out something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Could I use an FTZ? Yes. In transit. Not until it gets here though. But. Right, but but yes, you could put that product into a zone. Um, you know, you think there's a quality problem, you can go check it, maybe half that shipment's good, half is bad. Um, keep keep the half you want and get, you know send the other half back and then you only pay duties on that first half instead of paying duties on that entire shipment and half of it not being good. So I think there is an opportunity. The other thing that we see a lot is, you know, cargo that's moving from, like I said, uh, China into Long Beach down to Laredo and then eventually into Mexico. 
Um, you see stuff from Mexico into Canada. So anything that's transiting the country, um, there could be a benefit um, depending on what kind of work needs to be done. So in, in, in essence, something that's, something that's in transit, unless it's from a zone to zone transfer, isn't really in a zone. It's just moving right. normal, you know, it's getting ready to cross the border, it's getting ready to come in the country, ocean or air. Correct. Once it gets here, then the determination is made, do I enter the commerce and pay duties and taxes, mm -hmm. or do I enter a foreign trade zone? And defer the duties and taxes, mm -hmm. or do I enter a bonded warehouse? It's kind of at the time it gets to the port that that decision is made. Right. Right. Hopefully before then, but at the last minute, yeah, that decision needs to be made then. Okay. Um, we've got two questions that I think go hand in hand. Um, one, can can we you elaborate more on the application process mm -hmm. and identify what kinds of fees? Maybe not the, the actual, what the cost is, but what kinds of fees are, and I'm thinking, you know, paying for the permits and the zone, right. and things like that. Maybe you could explain both of those in the application process. So they kind of go hand in hand. So from a fee perspective, um, a lot of the fees are going to depend on how much work, one, you want to do yourself. So, you know, if, if you want to put some time and some energy into doing this with a partner, you know, I think the fees can become reasonable and kind of what you're looking at is we talked about you need to have a manual that says what are your processes so if you don't have one of those a lot of the times there's a big chunk of those fees that go into just creating that manual itself um, you have another chunk um, of fees that are just involved in you know filling out the application submitting the application you know normally there's a meeting with customs in your respective port um, things like that. So you're paying for the time of someone to go do that as well. There are also um, fees that go to the actual foreign trade zone. So like here in Kansas City, there, there are fees that go to the Greater Kansas City Foreign Trade Zone Board in order for you to, um, it, it's just, an, I'll call it an application fee is the easiest way to think about it. No different than you pay an application fee to do a lot of different things. Okay. So those are some of the fees associated um, with it. So I would say they're really broken out into probably um, three chunks and, and the first big, you know, the first chunk is fees just to the, to your respective foreign trade zone board. Um, the, the second chunk of fees is going to be in relation to whatever service provider um, you're using to help on with the application itself. And then that third chunk is going to be that manual. And so I kind of break those three up because we have we see people that have manuals, you know, but they don't. They need help getting through the application, or they're going to handle the application on their own, but they've never put a manual together before, and so they need help working through that process. Okay. And that's the reason. Um, do you know anything about other countries' foreign trade zone situations? Please use China as an example. Do they also have both foreign trade zones and bonded warehouses? China has, uh, I'm not as familiar um, with China. They do have some bonded warehouses. Sorry about that. I had something pop up on my screen here. Um, Sorry about that technical difficulty. Um, <laughs> uh, so China does have bonded warehouses, but they use them a little bit differently. Cargo goes into bonded warehouses as it's going through the customs clearance process there in China specifically. So that is definitely different than what a bonded warehouse is used for here in the US. Um, there are some different opportunities with Mexico. Um, or product can go down there um, on a red seal and maybe clear in another location. But once again, no other country really to my knowledge has the kind of robust foreign trade zone program that the U S has uh, where we allow companies to do things to their product without ever entering that product into the commerce of our country and pay customs duties on it. So it's a, it's a very big, um, benefit that we have being in the U.S. and most countries, at least none that I'm currently aware of, have that type of a program. What about um, a question about Mexico? Mm -hmm. What about 
foreign trade zones in Mexico or the Maquiladora? So process? Mexico has Maquiladoras. Um, you can kind of think of, if you think, if you think back to that, the slide where we talked about um, zone restricted merchandise, where that product has to either be destroyed or be exported. Um, maquilas are very much the same way. So a maquila is in Mexico. So you have product that goes into the maquila, um, it gets manufactured, that product then has to come back out. So maquilas are designed more as zone restricted only. So maquilas aren't selling domestically in Mexico, they're only selling abroad, um, usually just to the US, but not always. Um, but so that's where, you know, we see customers take advantage of that because of labor rates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, labor rates are cheaper there than they are here. So we definitely see that, you know, we're not getting any political conversations about right, wrong, or indifferent, but that is how um, really people take advantage of those. That product goes down, you know, maybe there are certain things that need to be done to that product. Um, maybe there's other product that's well, they're sourced locally in Mexico that gets added to it before it comes back into the U.S. or comes back in to get exported somewhere. So that's really where um, the FTZ idea goes in Mexico, but it's the Maquiladora. Um, now it's called the IMEX program, I-M-M-E-X. It's, it's just an updated name for the Maquila program, um, but that's really how it works. That product has to get exported back out of the country. Okay. Um, we got a question. Um Josh, Josh had asked when he when he registered for for this. Uh, Josh in the New York, um, it asked about foreign trade zones. Where is the foreign trade zone actually located at? And I think you had the one example, but then we also had a uh, question reported here: uh, Where can a foreign trade zone be located in general? For example, my manufacturing facility is located in a more remote area. Can an FTZ still be placed here? or are there regulations set by customs? Actually, this is another area that we don't talk about the differences between bonded warehouses and foreign trade zones, but um, the foreign trade zone is, since part of that process is going through the foreign trade zone board, as long as we can get your area, your land designated as a site for a foreign trade zone, we can get foreign trade zones in some remote areas. Bonded warehouses, by law, say they have to be within the port limits of of your respective port. So from Kansas City, uh, for those of you that live here, you can think of the port area as the I-435 loop that goes around the city. Anything outside of that city is going to be much, or outside of that loop is going to be tough for us to get a bonded warehouse. Foreign trade zones work. If we want to go back up here real quick, um, you can kind of see here how, you know, Kansas City is um, right down, I was going to point and you guys can't see my finger, but, uh, <laughs> Um, right where the rivers meet. Yeah, right, right where the rivers meet, um, you know, kind of right in this area. And, you know, this zone is about, what, an hour and a half northeast of Kansas City. Yeah. Um, you know, this zone is probably right about the same, hour, hour and a half. So, you know, these are definitely out here, out in the Topeka area that are definitely going to be that hour or so away as well. So we really expand um, the area for that you know, this is just an example in Kansas City, but as long as there is a zone, you know, and you can get your land zone as, you know, as foreign trade zone, then you can go through that activation process. Um, we can really start to stretch the, the boundaries of where those can be in remote areas don't matter as much. So then the real question is, is if I could, if someone's wondering, can I be a foreign, a trade zone, the, the call needs to be to the foreign trade zone board. Correct. In their, in their local port. Correct. Right. To, to see if it could, uh, and I hope that that answers your question and uh, Josh's came question as well. Um, we also had a question uh, that was submitted at that time. Uh, Debbie Lumery, um, who's looking into this, um, reach out. We would be happy to help you do some analysis to see if it would be worth it. Absolutely. If you are looking to be a foreign trade zone, um, like Debbie said that she's looking into, um, reach out to us. We can help you do some of that analysis um, relatively easy. If you've got an ACE account, you know how much you import, mm -hmm. you can run some reports or we can help you get set up on that and actually do that analysis to say, to see where and, and if this would benefit you and how it might benefit you. Um, and that goes, and I will extend that invitation to anybody on the call today. Um, if you if you want to know, if, you know, if you if you're looking into this, um, ask the question. Ask us. Feel free to give us a call. Our contact information is out there as well. Um, looking at a couple uh, additional questions that um, some folks submitted at the time. 
um, of registration. That one's for next month, so uh, yeah, that one's for next month, it looks like. <laughs> I think that's all. Well, we've still got uh, about uh, five minutes left in 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 today's. Uh, and again, we try, we always try to end on time in consideration of, uh, of, of your comments and so forth. What should, um, in addition to the fees and and you talked about the manual, um, what's the thing that people should be looking out for the most? Um, I think making sure that you do the work up front to know what you're really looking at potentially saving. Um, and I, I kind of go back to that horror story that, that I talked about where somebody came in, pitched a very large savings, and th the people didn't understand their business well enough to know that there's no way those numbers actually exist inside of their business. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's the biggest concern um, as people get excited about foreign trade zone, um, because I do think it's a great opportunity and I really think there's some benefits that exist, but I certainly think that you need to make sure that you do the work on the front end before you start down the road or else you're going to spend some money and then realize it's not worth it and you're not going to recoup that money like you thought you were. So, you know, reach out to an expert, you know. I would prefer it to be us, but even if it's not, reach out to an expert. The foreign and, Trade Zone Board. Yeah, yeah, you can reach out to the Foreign Trade Zone Board. There's There are firms that specifically just do Foreign Trade Zone Consulting. So reach out to somebody who's done this before, understands what to look for, looks at, you know, how much does your inventory turn in here? What kind of duties are we talking about? How many lines are we talking about? And get, get somebody that knows uh, more about Foreign Trade Zone involved in some of that analysis portion up front. Because once you once someone gets involved and understands, they can normally pretty quickly tell you, hey, this doesn't make sense. You guys probably don't need to go any farther forward because the, the savings just isn't there. Or they might be able to look at it and say, hey, we really need to dive into this. I think there's a big amount of savings on the table. So Adam, Something that always gets me is a lot of customs brokers don't talk about foreign trade zones to their clients. Can you explain why? Our fees go down. Um, so, um, and it's because of that scenario we talked about, a thousand customs entries compared to 52. Um, you know, there are other things. 214s, they're just not as expensive as an entry. Um, there's a lot less information required, um, you know, and, and I'm only doing 52 customs entries, so there's just not as many fees associated. And you know that's a terrible thing to say, but it's it's the facts, and and that's how that works. Is you know normally um, in our experience, though, do our fees go down? Yes, but by the time you get through all of the 214s, you know most people end up having to do an extra entry or two every. You know we end up getting into a scenario where you about take a wash on your custom brokerage fees. Um, but the reason a lot of people, assuming you're paying an outside party, the reason a lot of people don't is there's a lot of customers that once they decide to go into a foreign trade zone, want to pull the 214 process at entrance into the zone in-house. And that's really where then you see fees. But if you're paying a service provider to do the whole thing, I would say you're probably going to be a wash. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I, I am showing, um, right now at 2.30 um, central time, um, 3.30 on the east coast, and that is the, uh, the time that we had designated to, uh, to, to handle this session, this Q&A session. I will remind everybody that following this session, you will get an email from our marketing department with a link to this presentation that you can feel free to share with whomever you want. These will be published out on YouTube as well. If you have any additional questions, you can forward those to us and we will uh, start a question and answer in for Foreign Trade Zones on our website and those questions uh, and answers will be posted there as well. So again, everybody will get uh, links to this presentation, to the PowerPoint presentation portion of it as well following this event. And, and as always, I'd like to thank you for uh, being a part of this Scarborough University webinar and part of our webinar series. We will be with you again next month, um, I believe on 
foreign, what's... I think next month is our uh, free trade agreement. Free trade agreements, I believe, is next month. So anyways, um, we have these every single month for one hour. It's a great learning opportunity. Please feel free to invite anybody that you need to. And we sure appreciate your time, your great questions, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks, Thanks guys.